Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Professor Doug Berger from UT Austin. Uh, Professor Berger is uh, one of the leaders of the TRIPS project at Texas, and he'll be telling us about some work uh, coming out of that project. Okay. So, welcome back. Thanks, Rich. It's great, great to be back. Thank you all for coming. Uh, I'd like to certainly invite you all to ask questions at any point during the talk. Uh, it's a small group, so we can be as interactive as you'd like. And I certainly have more material than we have time, so you may see me skipping over significant numbers of slides, and please just bear with me. Uh, this, this work is joint with Steve Keckler and Catherine McKinley, who are two of my colleagues at UT. Uh, and so I, I've titled the talk, Bulldozers, Termites, and Chainsaws, really to talk about you know, three ways you can solve a problem uh, in the general purpose space you know, at different levels of granularity. So if you want to take down a house, right, you can hit it with one big bulldozer, or you can attack it with a million termites, or you can have 20 guys go after it with chainsaws. And that's really sort of a good metaphor for what we're facing in the multi-core space. And I'm going to talk more about that. Uh, so I think you know, now it's sort of funny because I, I've been giving this talk for a while talking about the, the end to single process scaling in conventional ISAs, at least at the exponential rates people are used to. Uh, and now you know, saying multi-core is the future sort of sounds really uh, hackneyed to some degree. Uh, so I'm not going to say it, although it's on my slide. Um, but I, but we, we sort of saw some of these trends uh, early, not, certainly not all of them, but in particular looking at the end of kind of wide issue processor scaling or at least a significant slowdown uh, in 2000 and then looking at, at limits to clock rate scaling in 2002. And although we, in our 2002 work, we really saw that it was diminishing returns that were going to affect pipelines and actually power turned out to be a more serious constraint. And so the, the end of the 40% per year frequency scaling and processors came a lot sooner than even we had, had anticipated. Uh, and so, the, so you've got those two trends. And then a third trend is communication delays on chip. Chips are going to be looking like distributed systems in the future with lots and lots of both architecturally visible and microarchitecture networks. And so, and since power is such a serious constraint, really the efficiency of communication around that chip, how far do your operands travel in aggregate will be one of the things that determines the efficiency of your computation. And so metrics that we might be thinking about in the future are something like, you know, how many kilometers of operands am I routing per second, or how many kilometers of, of, of uh, probably millimeters in this case, you know, of, of wiring do I need to route per operand. Okay. And so if, you're not, if your software isn't doing a good job of, of mapping your data and your parallel computation, either ex explicit or implicit parallel computation to your chip, you're going to do all this communication and you're going to lose, lose both performance and power efficiency. Please. You mentioned kilometers. Uh, are you ignoring the issue of how wide the data is? For a generation, we've shipped 32 bits even when we need just one bit. Now, if it costs you power, clearly it costs you eight times less to ship a nibble than, than, than That's a That's exactly a right. So, you know, if, if, I'm, if I ship 32 bits one kilometer, that's 32 kilometers in the aggregate. Of, of, uh, of traffic. So yeah, it's, I'm not talking about just for one, one bit. I'm talking across all, all your bits. And again, that's a metric of power efficiency. So if you can mine out all the bits you don't care about, uh, you know, you'll, that's a good, a good metric for efficiency. And of course, at the end of the day, that really just turns into power and performance. Right? But that's, that's one way to reason about it. OK, so, so industry, because of these trends, uh, has shifted to multi-core architectures. And it's really trivial just to stamp out a lot of cores. Okay, we know how to do that. We know how to connect them with mesh networks. Uh, but you know, the, <laughs> the question is, can we actually use all those cores we're stamping out? And if you go to a, a fixed process independent area for your core, the number of cores increase exponentially. And so, uh, and you know, we've sort of, hey, Trishul, we, we've, we've definitely exploited the fact that we have diminishing efficiency per transistor uh, you know, to make the, the, the processors both power scalable and increase at a, you know, sort of a lower rate than Moore's law, but still exponentially. Uh, and now if we just translate that directly into processors, uh, 
you know, you see, you see an exponentially growing number of cores, and it takes so long to parallelize a program, that's not something software is going to be able to deal with. But what about the interconnectivity of the, the cores? I mean, isn't that, it's not going to scale that well. It, the interconnectivity of the cores, the scalability depends on what you're doing. You know, if you have them attached to a mesh network, uh, you can scale in two dimensions as long as you want. And if they're all working on local, you know, if, if, they're all, if, if a series of adjacent cores are, have a working set captured in their internal caches, they just communicate locally, you're fine. But if you've got, you know, if, if all of them need to communicate off chip to your IOs, or they all need to communicate across the chip, you've got this kilometers per second problem, and you're going to lose a lot of efficiency. Okay, so it's really, you know, it's spatial computation, but now being applied to the application level. So we've got, you know, you all know or what, understand the programmability problem very well. There's the power efficiency problem, but a, a really more important question, and and we've got resiliency and failure and reliability problems on top of the already very hard programming problem that we have, and then of course memory bandwidth and latency. So all of these make an already very hard programming problem harder. But the question that we really tried to address in, in our work uh, was the granularity issue. So, and this is the termites, chainsaws, and bulldozers question. Please. You can also have, I guess, the question of, of heat density, I guess, too, is if you could take the line of reasoning and view that minimizing kilometers would, you know, be maximizing locality, you could achieve a certain density of, of operations that might cause selective cores on a multi-core ship to be overly hot. That's right. There are trade-offs here, too. There aren't absolutes. I, I certainly agree with that. I mean, I think if you, if you can get all of your computation to be very local, you may exacerbate your power density problem. It's really a power issue. Right. You know, and that, that power translates directly into heat, of course. But then you're also getting a very efficient computation. And so you can slow it down then and get more efficient performance you know, per watt than if you're if you've got it very spread out and you're doing massive amounts of communication and burning a lot of joules trying to get up to a certain level of performance. So in some sense, if you're, if you're, very, if you're commu computing very locally on a small number of adjacent cores and you have a thermal problem, that's a good problem to have because we're getting very efficient computation and we can slow it down. Now, you may want to move things slightly farther apart so you hit a sweet spot in between communication, and, you know, but, but you may just be able to slow down the frequency and get the same benefit. So there's, there's definitely an interesting optimization in space that I think we have no idea how to deal with. Uh, but coming back to the granularity issue, you know, so right now what we're, what we're doing is we have this exponential number of cores and we're exposing uh, a gran expo exponentially growing number of cores. We're exposing them to software, but the right granularity and topology uh, and interface to software is being chosen at design time. And so you, you may have a company that picks uh, that gives you a chip with a small number of bulldozers, you know, very wide issue superscalar cores with aggressive speculation, uh, and then your application turns out to have lots of very fine grained parallelism, and you're doing all this extra crud in the microarchitecture to mine parallelism explicitly. It's very easy to get at, you know, because you've got vectors or data level parallelism or loop level parallelism, and then conversely, you know, you, you say, okay, well, I'll build a chip that does that, and so I build a chip of termites. Uh, you know, sort of a Pico chip type design, uh, you know, where I view Niagara as somewhere in between, right? Maybe that's the chainsaws. And then you've got an application that has very irregular concurrency or very little at all, and you just can't map down to that. And you, re you want a lot of speculation, you want hardware to mine out what parallelism is in there. And so really, finding that granularity uh, and, and conveying that to software in an efficient way, you know, designers are choosing that design time, and then you've got what you've got. And that's a real problem. Okay, so what, so what we're trying, what we tried to do is to come up with architectural techniques that would allow you to dynamically vary the granularity and present the right level of granularity to the software developers. Okay, and so, so the first part of my talk won't focus on that, the second part will, but really the philosophy here and my philosophy for going forward is that the architects, microarchitecture and ISA people, you know, in your system architecture, need to find mechanisms that allow the application to meet it halfway. Okay, you, you really want to expose enough hooks so that the hardware can give the right configuration to the application rather than giving a fixed rigid, rigid configuration with lots of stuff exposed and saying to the application, okay, you manage that. That's just too complex. I mean, I think we've seen in the past lots of efforts in the architecture space 
that expose too much to the software and the software can't handle it. Right? So we really, we really want a lot, of that, uh, a lot of that adaptation to be hidden behind a clean architecture, maybe some hints going down. The architecture configures itself to, to, to look like a topology that the software can actually use. And I think that's really has been the focus of my research over about the past year and is the focus of it going forward for the near future. Okay, so uh, now I'm, we in, in my group took a, a blank sheet design and, and came up with uh, what would we do if we had you know, no constraints and so I know that this for a lot of you, uh, I apologize to those of you that have seen this first part of the talk before uh, for edge instruction sets and you know we're sort of definitely out in academic la la land right now uh, with respect to you know everything needs to be x86 in the in the high performance space but if you look at the layers of virtualization that people are putting on it's not inconceivable that you end up having something like this underneath an x86 virtualization layer you know certainly Transmeta, Transmeta did that with the VOIW interface uh, Intel did it with a RISC-like interface they just had two layers of hardware to get down to a RISC-like pipeline okay so uh, please stop me if you have questions and again I apologize if, if you know, some of you have seen this uh, ad nauseum before. I know that the UT people are probably uh, rolling their eyes, so the UT graduates. Uh, okay, so an edge architecture is a new class of ISA or a different class of ISA than, say, CISC or RISC or VLIW. And it really has two defining characteristics. The first is that a program sequence is broken up into a sequence of instruction blocks. Okay, so these, are, these may be basic blocks, hyper blocks, uh, just aggregations of instructions with internal predication. But they, the, the key thing is that these blocks are logically atomically committed and fetched. So you don't, in the architecture, you don't ever commit half a block. The presumption is these are, in some sense, almost mini transactions, but uh, at, a, at a different level of granularity than you typically think about transactions, kind of architecturally constrained uh, transactions. And then within the block, the ISA has support for instructions to build little static data flow graphs that it directly target one another. Okay, so there is no shared namespace within a block. That shared namespace exists outside of blocks and between blocks. And so you go from block to block, you communicate through registers and memory on block boundaries. You may go through memory within a block also, but in terms of direct instruction to instruction communication, that's data flow execution. And so an instruction will point to the next instructions that consume its operands. And the goal here is to try to find a balance between the efficiencies that you get from data flow computation, like in the old data flow machines, uh, and a conventional imperative sequential programming model so that you can support conventional languages. You know, the old data flow machines required that the architecture put very strong restrictions on the programming languages, and so they were forced to develop new programming models and programming languages to support that architecture. So we, we developed this class of ISAs as a hybrid approach to try and mine some of the efficiencies of data flow out but still let you run C and Fortran and Java uh, and all that. And so there is still a notion of sequential control and the data flowness of the computation is bounded within these blocks. Okay, so uh, in the execution model, you take, and this is what we currently do in the, in the TRIP system, you take a bunch of basic blocks and you merge them together into these larger grayed out structures that we call TRIPS blocks. Uh, and those are you know, these blocks in this edge ISA uh, and then within a block, you'll translate it into a data flow graph and then instantiate that through the ISA. And so I've shown a little example there of an if-then-else code. If P is equal to zero, you do Z is A, a times two plus three. Uh, otherwise, Z is, Z is B plus, uh, times three plus four. And then you might imagine here how this data flow graph actually gets instantiated. And the, uh, you'll notice that the branch here, the if-then-else, is turned into a test. And these two uh, add instructions are predicated this, is, this hollow bubble means that it's predicated on a false path, and this means it's predicated on a true path. And so if the test produces a true predicate, this instruction will actually execute, whereas if it produces a false instruction, this instruction will execute, and the one that, is not, the one that receives a non-matching predicate won't actually fire. Is that whole little graph there, is that one of those blocks that you just described? Yes, this would go within one block. block. That's right. And the reason we're using predication is, of course, you know, a, since a block is atomic, you don't want to have internal transfers of control. So you predicate out until you form a single thing that's one control unit. Uh, so you're not going to be jumping around within a block. You can't have branches within a block. Okay. Uh, and I've got a, I'm going to give a, dive into that example in a little bit more detail in a slide or two. Uh, 
And so architecturally, at the next level up, an edge block you know, is between a 1 and 128 instruction data flow, static data flow graph. Uh, and the 128 is an architectural parameter that an ISA chooses, like the number of registers in a RISC ISA. You can read in 32 values from the, and I'm talking now about the TRIPS ISA in particular. You can read in 32 instructions from a register file. You can write out 32 values to the register file when the block ends. You can do some number of store of loads to memory during the execution of the block. And then when the block is complete, you've produced some number of stores, some number of write instructions in a terminating branch. And when you receive all of those outputs, you then say, okay, the block is done, it's safe to commit it. And you dump all of that state to architectural state at once. So this is sort of the, the, you know, the transaction-like behavior. Go ahead. Within a block, you can't read, you can't store into memory and read the same value back out. Okay, so that's a, that's a great question. Within a block, uh, can you store a value to memory and, and read it back out? And, and the answer is, yes, you can. Okay, that's certainly fine. But that, that store does not become, vis become visible uh, until the block actually commits. And the microarchitecture needs to forward that uh, internally. So we think of this as a weak, weakly ordered memory model. Ben? How do you handle precise exceptions? Uh, precise, in, so exceptions are no longer instruction precise. Okay. okay, so they're block precise. So you either need to roll back to the beginning of a block or you need to finish it before you service the exception. Okay, this does have some interesting implications for I.O. certainly. You know, and that's, that's something that we've, we've definitely put some thought into. I think you already like, answered the question partially when you talked about relaxed memory model. So in this picture, I see conveniently the stores and the loads are on completely different sides of the picture, and the stores are all in parallel. When you, when you do that, do you, what are your guarantees of ordering between those memory accesses? Okay, so uh, I'm actually going to get to that in some, in some more detail. But let me talk about the, I'll tell you at a high level, that remember, this is still supporting a sequential memory semantics. So within a block, all of the loads and stores are tagged with a sequence number. Okay. And the hardware needs to enforce the sequence number. Okay. Okay? So this is, this is the external architectural perception of a block. But within it, you know, this store might go to this load, and you need to make sure you get that right. And that was the problem with the old data flow machines. Right? They didn't really have ordered loads and stores. Anything could happen in any order. And, and so they needed to get rid of ambiguous memory references in the programming model. So you use each memory location once, and you slap a full empty bit on, and you can synchronize. Uh, but reuse of mem no reuse of memory has some uh, you know, non-positive uh, implications. OK, so let me, let me just very quickly talk about what some of the instructions look like. Uh, so this shows the majority of the f instruction formats in the TRIPS ISA. And so you'd have 128 of these instructions within a block. They're 32-bit instructions. I want to talk about the G format up there in particular. You know, most of, some of it is very standard. You have an opcode, an extended opcode field. There's a two-bit predicate field that says, is this instruction predicated or not? I.e., should I wait for a predicate before firing? And then these two, the T0 and T1 up there, are targets. And so instead of source registers, you've got target fields. And what those target fields say is, where do you send your result? Okay, to which instruction should you send your result? So an add instruction in the G format there would sit in a reservation station uh, and it would receive its two operands, and it doesn't know where they're coming from. They arrive with a tag that says, and this is you know, typical or standard to the old data flow machines, it arrives with a tag that says, this is what I want. You know, and when you get both operands, you do the add, and then where do you send the result? You send the results to those two targets. And those are two other instructions within the block, or up to two other instructions within the block. Uh, and uh, let me only point out one other uh, unique feature to the ISA. This load store ID field is exactly that sequence number that we were describing. And since it's a five-bit field in our particular architecture, you can only have between one, uh, between zero and 32 loads and stores within one of these blocks. Or only one between uh, zero and 32 loads and stores that actually execute. You, you can have uh, mutually exclusive predicate paths that share load store IDs. OK, so uh, very quickly to go through uh, one of these edge block examples. Uh, I've got some risk code uh, on, the, on the left with a, a load and add, a store and add, a media and a branch. Uh, in, our, in our software tool chain, we've got an intermediate format called TIL, or TRIPS Intermediate Language. This is what you write assembly code in by hand. Okay? And then this is actually still using conventional uh, instruction semantics. Uh, 
meaning that you've got you know, your input operands here and you produce your result and it goes there. Except these have been turned into temporaries that are, that are in some sense data flow arcs. Um, but you still look at your source operands. And so for example, this add is going to read from temporary one and temporary three. Those are produced by the two read instructions up here to the register file. So like I said, you read your initial results. Those get mapped onto temporaries. Those temporaries are here. You produce T4. T4 will go to the store and the add immediate. And so what we're doing here is we're essentially doing static renaming. We're eliminating the, the, the uh, reuse of register names. And then at the, in the very back end of the compiler, it's a very easy step to translate it into TRIPS assembly language or, or TASL format, where you're now actually in target format. And so an add doesn't know where its source operands are coming from. It just knows to which instructions it's going to send the result. Okay, and that's, of course, just a, a, that's a, trivial, a trivial step to take. So, uh, like I said, we've got the read instructions that read out of a general purpose register and send their results to target, shown over at the right in red. Uh, we've got predicated instructions, and so that branch has now turned into a test, which result, sends its result to instruction 7 or 8. And these say whether you go to the fall-through block or actually take the branch and go to a different block. Okay, so you, there's, no more any, there's no longer any fall-through path. You have, to, you have to jump to two distinct block addresses. And only one of these two branches will fire. Okay? And something else I didn't mention is that the way that you know that a block is done is because it's produced all of its outputs. And the outputs are actually stat The number of outputs is, is known statically, and that's specified. So you count the outputs that the block has produced, and when that count reaches the completion value, then you're done, and you can commit the block. Okay, so we talked about... Go ahead. The number of outputs is known statically. Could that be a result of a predicated instruction? So you'll have predicated. That's a, that's a great question. So we made a decision in the architecture to force every possible predicated path within the block to produce the same number of outputs. And so what that requires is the insertion in some paths of null instructions, which basically say, I'm down this path. It's got fewer outputs. So here's three extra outputs to count. But it has no other, it has no other meaningful, val meaningful uh, you know, uh, result. Okay, so, and, and so that adds a little bit of overhead, but it greatly simplifies the job of the hardware to detect completion rather than trying to figure out, all right, I'm on this path, so I need to wait for five outputs rather than seven. Because you have these dummy outputs, you also have the integer version of the floating point NAND, not the numbers. Do we have what? I'm sorry? The floating point standard has NAND, not a number. Sure. You have the, essentially not a value if you store that kind of thing, so it doesn't get picked up later and called garbage. Uh, well, if you raise an exception when you produce something like that, we'll handle it the same way a conventional architecture will. We'll just handle it on a block boundary. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas, but if you don't, if you don't handle an exception like that, and you just want to keep producing garbage, uh, it's the same trade-off as in a conventional architecture. Mm -hmm. You know, so I don't. We didn't do anything different there with respect to to not a numbers or you know underflow or infinity or anything like that. Okay, I want to make one more comment about, about the ISA. So another source of, of overhead here is that when you think about writing to a register, you're doing an implicit broadcast because you're writing to a shared, val or shared namespace that everybody else can read from. You know, many instructions can read from after the fact. Whereas here we're breaking that model, and this is true of, of you know, conventional or classic data flow machines. And now, so if I have one instruction which is producing a value and sending it to only one place and then the value dies, data flow execution is really efficient. It's much more efficient than writing into a shared register value and then, and then, you know, and then the, value, the, the, the presence of that value sort of increases the size of the register file and then everyone else has to incur that extra size when they're reading it. I mean, not dynamically, but you're sizing the register to support that. Whereas here, if you're writing into one place and you're reading from it in 32 places, it's actually expensive to fan that out. And so we need to build little software fan out trees. And so we have what are called move instructions that actually take an input value and then just provide extra targets. And so they're just sort of taking the value and forwarding on. And as we found out, the move instructions are one of the things we got wrong in the architecture. Uh, we, need, we should have done a much better job of building wide fan out moves at the cost of some extra complexity because some of our programs end up being 30 or 40 percent move instructions. And we had no idea that it'd be that large. Okay, you know, if only I had known, right, you know, things like that. Okay. Okay, I'm going to skip over this. So I'm going to talk a little bit about, uh, I've got two microarchitectures I want to talk about in this talk, and TRIPS is kind of 
you know, it's, it's a little bit old hat at this point, so I'm going to go through it very briefly uh, to give a sense of the things that we need to know to discuss the second generation architecture. So uh, the goal for this microarchitecture was to show how to use these data flow like ISAs to build a larger single processor. This doesn't answer the question of termites versus chainsaws versus bulldozers and, and dynamic granularity, but what it does do is show how to build a bulldozer. Okay, so you know the, the, the cessation and scaling of issue width of conventional processors was in part because what conventional processors do, certainly out of order superscalar processors, is they do data flow execution, they just do it in the hardware. So if you think about what a superscalar processor does, it fetches instructions, and then I, I, my apologies to the microarchitecture experts in the audience who are rolling their eyes, uh, and not really, he's not being rude, it's just, I, I know internally he must be. Uh, and then they rename the instructions, and the renaming of the instruction creates these unique arcs, and really adds instructions on to an in-flight data flow graph. And then the broadcasting of physical register tags in the issue window is actually the traversal of that data flow graph. And then the committing of instructions is the pulling of instructions off the top of the data flow graph. So in some sense, the compiler builds an internal data flow graph, does register allocation, linearizes the code, generates the code, thereby throwing the graph away. And then you feed that linear list of instructions to a superscalar processor, and it reconstructs that graph in hardware using lots of broadcast broadcasting tables and cams, and it's maintaining this dynamic data flow graph, which the compiler knew and threw away, and it's constantly you know, adding on instructions and pulling instructions off and sort of maintaining a sliding window of that graph. And, and, and the, the hardware structures needed to maintain and track and traverse that graph are not scalable with issue width or really with instruction window size. And that's one of the reasons, and possibly, the, in my opinion, the primary reason why this issue width st stopped scaling. You, know, you get quadratic complexity as you scale up the issue width to try to maintain this graph. And maintaining bigger graphs are how you mine more implicit parallelism from a code sequence. And so what we tried to do is break those quadratic dependencies, make that graph explicit, so you can build much larger graphs and scale up to much wider issue with lower complexity and lower power uh, consumption. And so this is really the attempt to build a bulldozer out of those more efficient uh, graphs with, that are broken into lots of, of large static data flow graphs, which the hardware then links up dynamically. Go ahead. So in the architecture on the previous slide, you were showing you do all of your loads, and then your memory system was not being used uh, while you were actually doing the calculations, and then you'd do all of your stores. Was that, was that accurate? Well, that, that, so that, that block was, a, was an architectural abstraction to an outside observer. Okay. Okay, so if I have multiple threads, right, you're in, you, you, it's like transactions, you're interleaving blocks. Okay. And so you wouldn't see all the stores produced from one block, right, until that block committed. Okay, but within that thread, loads within the block and loads for speculative later blocks are going to be picking up those stores. This is a multi-threaded architecture. Okay. Uh, well, it's not, it's not antagonistic to, multi, to, to a multi-threaded architecture. Just the memory model has some implications for multi-threaded. And yes, this is a multi-threaded architecture, but you know, it's, it's so uh, I'm not sure how to, it can support multi-threading with some, some restrictions on the memory model in terms of weakness, okay? So, so I actually wanna, wanna make this point a little bit clearer. So the way I think of this stuff is you've got these static data flow graphs, okay, which in a superscalar processor are built dynamically. And then here's another graph, okay, and this is within one thread, so this is not a multi-threaded program, okay. And then in between these, you've got register values being written at the end of this block and read at the end of this block, and here's another block. So this is a linear sequence, okay. And, and these arcs are not known statically because, you know, you may or may not produce a register value from this block. So just like you don't know necessarily where your register value, who's going to produce your register value, based on the control path through a conventional program, okay? So these, are, so these register arcs, this might be R2, R1, and R3, are not resolved until runtime. And you can produce a store value here, which feeds a load in here and maybe in here. And these are also dynamic arcs. You know, these are actual data flow arcs that aren't known statically because of, you, know, you don't have perfect disambiguation and you have unknown control. And so what the architecture does is it will launch multiple of these blocks in flight speculatively from one thread, 
Okay? These arcs are all known statically, and so you get those efficiencies. These arcs you have to discover dynamically and use forwarding logic similar to a superscalar processor to stitch these together, thereby forming a much larger data flow graph, okay, consisting of multiple blocks in flight. And so in the TRIPS microarchitecture, we build up to 1,000 instruction or 1024 instructions in one big data flow graph consisting of up to eight big static chunks. Okay? Now, if you've got two threads, right now you've got to worry about the, the interleaving of operations because none of these stores will become visible until this block commits. And so in some sense, you're interleaving, you're interleaving blocks. And so in some sense, it really, if you wanted to support sequential consistency, you would actually need to turn this into an explicit transaction, generate a read and a write set, and roll back if anybody messed with your read set or your write set while you were executing. I'm, I, just, I think I just went totally off the rails. So I'm, so I'm uh, sorry if that was too glib. Go ahead. So, um, but the, the order you guarantee is you do all the loads in, in order, and you do all the stores in order, but you, you do mail do loads before you do the stores. Well, within one thread, you're supporting sequential memory semantics. So you guarantee that you're going to get the same answer as if each load and store was ex executed independently in program order. Okay? Across threads, the model is, you know, what I don't want to have happen is have a load and a store and a load and a store. These stores are only exported to the memory system on commit, but these are necessary to issue before commit. And so if I have a store over here to address and a load over here to an address, you know, I'm sort of I'm sort of violating some stronger consistency models. Right. And so what you'd really want to do is get all the permissions for the loads and the stores together, make sure that no one messed with it or changed it while this was executing. Okay? So you're trying to maintain sequential consistency? I'm saying this is how you would maintain sequential okay. consistency if that was a desired goal of the architecture. And what is your desired goal? You have to decide it. Well, the desired goal is we, we want to do research in, in, you know, in instruction level parallelism. Right? And I don't, I don't have a bunch of software customers screaming for some sort of relaxed memory model or sequential consistency. I want to n understand how this set of ideas could be adapted to provide the gamut of consistency models. Okay. And, and, and we know how to do that. There's, just, there's extra overhead for providing sequential consistency. Okay. But, it, but interestingly, it looks a lot like transactions. Right? So maybe this is some sort of grand convergence. I don't know. Go ahead. So does this architecture make it easy to provide, say, a multi-word uh, compare exchange? Because uh, you could sort of say, well, at the end of the block, uh, I want to write these locations, but they have to contain these values, otherwise we do the block. That's a really interesting question. I don't, I don't know the One answer. One of the big things that we don't have in our architectures that everybody wants is multi-word. When I was talking to Michael Scott about this, you know, who's done a lot of synchronization stuff, what he said is this is basically kind of an n-way, you can do an n-way compare and swap, right, very efficiently. So yeah, I think that's, I think that's right. But I, I don't want to say that it's, it, it has all these advantages because we certainly haven't implemented that. You could, you could you know, adjust the architecture to do that. But there is, this, there is certainly power in this notion of atomic commit of a large, you know, a large group of work at once, both from the transaction side and from the synchronization side. But there's also, you know, there, there are overheads. For example, if you want very responsive behavior to exceptions, right? You may be rolling back a lot of work. Okay. Okay, so uh, this is the, the microarchitecture itself is composed of a series of tiles, and this has to do with the distributed nature of the system that I talked about. So these are each independent tiles that are connected by a sequence of micronets or microarchitectural networks. Uh, each of these are execution tiles that can issue one instruction per cycle. These are banked register files, these are banked data caches, and banked instruction caches. And this is a global control tile that decides which block gets executed next. And so if at a very high level, you know, you, this decides we're going to execute a block. It sends a, it sends a tag to the instruction caches, which then stream 128 instructions across a network here, dropping off 16, uh, sorry, eight instructions in each of these 16 execution tiles. That's one block. This will then predict another block, send another command out, stream another block in, and you keep ch chunking on that pipeline until you have eight of these blocks in flight, and you've got a 1K window. And then meanwhile, in parallel, the, the inputs to the block are being generated by the register files. Data flow execution is going on across all of these blocks. Loads are being issued. Uh, loads values are being returned. Stores are being buffered over here in preparation for commit. 
register writes are being buffered here, branches are being written, and, and of course the oldest block, when all of its outputs are ready, it will commit with a multi-phase distributed protocol. Okay, so I can just sort of show you that very quickly. The global control tile on the global dispatch network will send out a command and stream instructions across to the execution tiles. Then, the oper then for one block, data flow execution will ensue and operands will flow around the operand network, and this is just a mesh uh, network. Uh, the register files and data caches will send little lightweight control messages to the global control tile as writes and stores complete, saying, okay, my outputs are accumulating and this is when you might want to take things off. Uh, then when, you, when a block has all of its outputs, you know, messages will be sent along the global control network to say you should commit the block. Okay, go ahead. Is this is a bucket brigade. How far can you scale it up? Well, you can actually scale this up arbitrarily far, but the question is, how much performance do you get when you scale it up? Uh, and I actually don't think here that scaling it beyond 16 tiles makes sense. I mean, or 16 execution tiles with, our, with the current architecture. Okay, um, 32, we tried that in simulation, it didn't work, so we built 16. In the second generation microarchitecture, I'm going to talk about some mechanisms to allow it to scale up further. And the second gen looks very different, but it's important to understand this uh, to, to get to that. So I'm going to do one more slide or two more slides on the TRIPS microarchitecture itself to show how blocks are, made, are, are mapped in because we need to understand this to go on to the follow-on design. Okay, so in a register tile, you've got, we support four threads running in flight on the machine at once, but let's just talk about one thread. So you've got... Uh, one register file up here per thread, and then you've got a bunch of read-write queues, and those are the queues that buffer uh, register reads that are waiting for earlier blocks to write to a register, or they're buffering values that have been written but haven't yet committed, and that's how we track these dynamic arcs, and also as well as aggregating uh, values to commit. Okay, and then at the, uh, at the execution tile, uh, you've got res some number of reservation stations, and we have one set of reservation stations for each block in flight. As I said, there were eight. And then you've got room for eight instructions within each block. Uh, and, you know, an instruction field and then, and then buffer space for the two operands that will be used to execute that instruction. And, of course, then those go, are fed to an ALU. And then finally, at the data tile, you've got uh, load store queues to buffer the in-flight loads and stores so that you can find these dynamic arcs of the loads and stores going around, as well as buffering store values before a block is committed. Okay, so none of this really differs that much from, from a general microarchitecture, uh, or some microarchitectures in the past. You know, there's, there's, there's elements similar to all of it. Okay, so let's say I've, I'm mapping one block in. I've got a header chunk with a few read instructions shown in green and a couple write instructions shown in blue, and then some number of instructions shown in red. Okay, and so those, th these get mapped into the read-write queues. The instructions get mapped into the reservation stations. Uh, and then in, the, in each block header, there's also a store mask that tells you which load store IDs correspond to stores. You need to know that so that you can detect completion of a block. And then, uh, and then so now I want to show you how an instruction target gets mapped to a reservation station. Okay, so when I generate a target, remember I showed you the, that 9-bit target field. Uh, Seven of the bits say which instruction is this going to within the block. Is it instruction number 127? Is it instruction number 43? Is it instruction number 2? Uh, and then there's two bits also with that 9-bit target type that says, is this a predicate you're generating? Is it the left operand or the right operand? So this tells you what you need to know. We dynamically prepend the three bits from the block in flight. Because remember, you're only communicating statically within your own block. So if this is block 4, you know, you need to know that the source was from block four and the destination is in block four. Okay, so those three bits tell you which block is this being produced by, so you can route it to the appropriate place within the same block. Okay, so here, for example, and then the seven bits, and this is very important for the next microarchitecture, the seven bits are an architecture abstraction that say, which instruction am I going to? So this is producing a value for instruction number 87. You know, if you look at these seven bits, and, uh, and operand one, but the microarchitecture is free to interpret those bits any way it wants to determine where that target instruction is going to go. Okay? So one microarchitecture might, said, might say instruction number 87 is over here. 
Another microarchitecture might say instruction 87 is over here. Another microarchitecture might have 42 functional units and say, oh, instruction number 87 is over here. So the, the target doesn't correspond to a specific, specific place in an architecture. It corresponds to an abstract number that the architecture, the microarchitecture then interprets. And so what we're going to do in the next microarchitecture is change this interpretation dynamically to resize the processor and, and change the way we're mapping instructions into these, into these graphs. Okay, in this case, we would be mapping into um, you know, block four, instruction slot three at uh, reservation at ex execution pile, uh, you know, two comma three, and so it would be going down over to there. So when the, when the when the source instruction fired, it would it would take these two fields, and that tells it which tile to go to, and then this field says which reservation station within that tile are you going to, and that's how and then, so that's the process of mapping a data flow graph. Um, you know, to these, uh, you know, to these substrates. Okay. And I'm actually going to jump ahead a little bit here. Okay, so if we, if we look at the prototype chip itself, uh, it consists of two processors. So this is two, two bulldozers, I guess. Uh, and then with, with a, an, a level two cache, hi Jim, with a level two cache in a, uh, also in a distributed network, and we call this a non-uniform cache, and it has a mesh network embedded in it as well. And, and, and so you start to see the, the notion, the necessary, or the necessity for spatial planning. Because here you've got multiple you know, network ports from your level two into your cores. And so if you can lay out the data here to align with the needs of the loads, you can actually turn this into almost like a vectorized you know, streaming engine. Um, and if you don't have that level of support, you're going to have lots of communication. You're going to lose a lot of efficiency. And so that's kind of the, one of the initial rationales for this notion of you know, kilometers per uh, second of operand traversal on one of these chips as a metric of efficiency. All right, so the prototype chip we built uh, has about 170 million transistors, uh, 1.06 kilometers of wiring uh, within the package, uh, and runs at 366 megahertz and 130 nanometer process. And I can show you a die photo here. These are baby pictures, I guess, um, where if you look at the, uh, the utilization on the chip, you know, a processor takes up a little over a quarter of the chip. Uh, we've got space here for the, the I.O. interfaces to DRAM, direct memory, your, your DMA controller, your chip to chip network, so chips can talk gluelessly to one another. Your L2 here, you can see the memory banks laid out here. But then if you look at the actual processor core itself, the vast majority of the area, or at least more than half of the area, is taken up by the actual execution piles. And this is because we've thrown away a lot of the gunk that you use to build these data flow graphs and maintain them on the fly. Uh, and so we're able to, to devote a lot more of the logic to the actual execution. Uh, you can see the space for I caches and the register tiles up here. I want to comment briefly on the data caches. The data cache area is actually really large. And it's broken up into two structures. And I don't know if you can see this from the back. One structure here, you can see by this rectangle here, is the actual data caches and the tags themselves, uh, which are eight kilobyte banks for an aggregate of 32K across each core, since there's four banks. You can see them there, one, two, three, four. These, these things, by the way, are I.O. pads, and so they kind of screw up the, the regularity of the tile spacing. This structure here below the data cache is actually an enormous cam, and that's our load store queues. And it's the, it's the really big wart on the design. So since you have a thousand loads and stores in flight, and you've got to maintain sequential memory semantics, you've got to get them in the right order to make sure that a, a later load will pick up the right value from an earlier store if they're the same address. And so we dump those thousand, it's actually 256 because you can only have 32 loads or stores per block because of that, sh that field I showed you earlier. But you've got those 256 operations and they could all go to one bank. And so we made a simplicity, uh, a simplicity versus elegance trade-off and just worst size all the cams. So each of these could hold up to 256 loads or stores. It takes up a lot of area. It's really area inefficient. It's enormously power inefficient. Uh, and, and so it underscores the fact that maintaining sequential memory semantics in a data flow-like machine is really hard. I mean, this is why all the, the, the data flow projects kind of ran into that, OK? Uh, and so you can see that they actually take up 13% of the processor core area. You know, for one microarchitectural structure, which is really ugly. Okay, and at the time we didn't have a solution to that. 
Okay, I want to make one, one other comment here. Uh, this, this notion of design modularity, you know, you've got these tiles on these distributed micro networks, actually provides very elegant boundaries for doing hierarchical verification. And so what we were able to do is break each tile up into subunits, verify those with random testing, uh, and then aggregate them into Unix, verif units, verify those, and then at the tile level what we do is we just hit it with all sorts of possible randomized legal combinations across the networks and, and really exercise the tiles pretty thoroughly. Uh, you, we don't have that many kinds of them, so because we, we stamp them out, there's only five kinds. And then when you, when you stitch them together, you just need, need, need to make sure that your distributed microarchitectural protocols are correct. And fortunately, ours are pretty simple, and then you verify the design. So we didn't prove it correct by any stretch of the imagination, but to this date we haven't found a single hardware bug uh, in the design, and our first silicon worked. You know, we had, we had our first spec benchmark uh, three weeks after getting the chip back. So, do you have a question? You, you, you really answer it. I was, I was suspecting that the first version of an architecture could also remove bugs by removing instructions with a manual, but you didn't do that. No, we actually, we actually got the chips back got them up in the lab, and then Hello World was, was 10 days, and the first spec benchmark was 21 days. And I think we actually just got lucky, but you know, I'll, I'll take it. We didn't have money for a second spin, so, uh, <laughs> so it's fortunate, uh, fortunate that we did. Okay, so, um, so we took some lessons learned from building this bulldozer, and, uh, and Jenner and pr have proposed and are evaluating a second generation microarchitecture that I think really lines up more with the goals of meeting applications halfway and, and providing a graceful path to exploiting parallelism rather than just bumping the problem up to the, to the programming languages and runtime system. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about that now. Okay, and I've, I, again, I apologize to those of you who, who saw an earlier version of this talk uh, the last time I was here. We've made a bunch of progress since then. But the high level, we call this model composable lightweight processors, or CLPs. And you can imagine a chip that's got, the one we're simulating has 32 cores, uh, and each of these is now a termite, or maybe not a termite, maybe a small chainsaw, maybe a hand axe. Um, but it's a, it's a small dual issue uh, core that has most of the power characteristics of an in-order issue core. And they're of course arrayed together and connected by a lightweight network with a bunch of memory banks. Uh, and so, of course, the idea here is that if you've got lots of threads, well, you know how to use this. You assign a thread to each core uh, and, and just run them run it as a, as a fine-grained, lightweight CMP, uh, but you now may be in a, con a, a position where you're, you're in a very power-limited environment and you're thermally limited. And so, of course, you can map threads to individual corners to keep them away from one another, but the key support we've put in the microarchitecture allows the, the runtime to come in and dynamically aggregate together some of these cores. And, of course, there's people here that understand this very well. Uh, you know, so the, some of the uh, core fusion work that Jose has done is, uh, is very similar to this, and, or ours is similar to that, I guess is a, another way to say it. Um, but the idea here is to aggregate these together and to form a, a, a single, an image of a logical processor to software uh, composed of multiple individual cores. And so, so for the rest of the talk, when I say core, I mean a hardware unit, you know, a dual issue processor. When I say processor, I mean a logical uh, image of a processor conveyed to software. Okay, so a processor is, is, constricted, is constructed of one or more cores. Okay, and then of course if you have some, some number of limited concurrency threads, you know, you may, you may choose for each thread the size of the processor you want to run on it. And since each of these are dual issue, you've got uh, four four issue cores, uh, two eight wide issue cores, and two 16 wide issue cores. And then of course the microarchitecture can support up to uh, one giant processor of 32 cores that's 64 wide issue. Uh, now, very few applications that we deal with need that, that level of issue width, but you actually do see performance benefits growing up to 32 here, although really the sweet spot is still 16. We're working on, and we're working on ways to extend it up to 128 cores. Um, but the, the, the reason that you sometimes benefit from scaling it up is that not only do you get higher issue width, which you really don't need much past 16 or 32, uh, is you get more data cache capacity by aggregating all these cores together. You get more data cache bandwidth, you get more branch predictor capacity, you get more load store queue capacity, you, know, you get more ports into the memory system. And so all of your structures scale up. You get more fetch bandwidth. And so you end up, you know, if your application is bottlenecked, uh, 
you know, you can add cores and sort of come over that bottleneck. And so really, go ahead, Rich. Understanding here, so that but when you're talking about issuing here, I mean we're still talking about the granularity as those edge blocks, the trips blocks. Yes. Like two to so you're too wide. It's two trips blocks at a time. No, um, actually, I'm sorry, I didn't make that more clear. If I look at one of these core, each of these cores can can hold one trips block at once. So it's a it's a 128 instruction window, and from that block, it can execute two instructions per cycle. Actually, two integer and one floating point instruction. And so in the in the aggregate, this large composed processor will hold 32 trips blocks in flight, which is a 4K, it's a, it's a 4K instruction window, uh, and can issue up to 64 instructions per cycle from that 4K window. Okay, and again, the, the, you'll notice that there, there are no quadratically complex structures here. I mean, it's all you know, linear additions. You do get some super linear uh, inefficiencies in that You've got a bigger, bigger processor to traverse, and so if you have an instruction being issued here that maps down to a data cache bank here, and its target is up here, you're now, okay, you've got more kilometers, right? You're routing operands across more network hops, and that actually is one of the things that limits you. Okay, so again, if software can com come in and start aligning memory to instructions, you end up with more efficiencies, and you can scale the core up higher. It's different places. I mean, if I just have my local thing, I have only so many bits to address them, but if I can aggregate them all together, I can redirect a, a, an output to a far away block, then I need more bits to address that. So right, and re remember that our, tar our instruction targets within one of these data flow bo blocks are, uh, use a seven bit target, okay? And so of those seven bits, you can choose to use, you know, zero to choose which core you go to, and seven bits to say within this core, I'm gonna use, select from one of 128 instructions, or I can use five bits to choose which core I go to, and each core will have then four instructions from each block, and I can use two of those bits to select from one of those four instructions on one block. So in some sense, the architectural limit here is 128 cores, because then you have one instruction from each block on each core, but if you, if you, if you smear out the block that, that uh, thinly, you're gonna, just gonna have a ton of communication. So kind of the natural limit is around 16 or 32. Uh, you can add address within another block, basically. Yes. Yes. Now, I, I want to make one, one more point here, which is that the, the stuff that we're working on now, really trying to get into the, the hybrid space between conventional uniprocessors and conventional multiprocessors, is that now, if you think from a single thread, well, maybe I'll put a, rather than taking each block and kind of distributing it or smearing it equally across the whole processor, Let's say I have a block with just a lot of serial dependencies. I don't want to do that because there's no parallelism. I'd really like to put the whole block here and just to get back-to-back -back issue down that dependence chain and then put the next block here, okay? And so now it starts to smell a little bit like having independent sequencers, but you still have a global flow of control and you're using register because the register space is distributed across this too. You know, R0 goes here, R1, R2, R3. You're actually using which register you write to determines where you're sending a message on this. Okay, so we're still, currently we're still simulating a very kind of flat, single threaded, but distributed program, but now you can start putting in hooks to say, well I'm really gonna be think of these as separate parallel entities, and I'm gonna be sending messages through registers. And that's, you know, a not, that's a small step towards parallelization. Um, but if it's too hard to parallelize your fetch stream, you know, your single thread, well at least you can start reasoning about these and, and, and getting different blocks of code executing in parallel, even if they're being fetched from a single, a single logical stream. Okay, so there's just a lot of points in the space here where the, the breakdown between conventional uniprocessors and parallel processors is blurring. Okay, um, so I think one, one, one lesson we learned from the TRIPS prototype is that on a lot of threads, and, and this is obvious, you know, when you think about it, that this, uh, the 16 wide issue processor, the bulldozer, is overkill for a lot of cases. It's overkill when you've got a thread with no concurrency, it's overkill when you've got a ton of lightweight threads, and it's overkill if you're in a really power constrained environment. Okay, and so what we wanted to do was exploit the same capability to, to map these, these, these static data flow graphs to a large or a small substrate, but then they'd be able to move up and down the granularity spectrum depending on what the needs of your current operating workload was. Okay, and that motivated the, uh, the uh, move to the next design. 
I don't want to run too far over, so I'm actually going to skip over uh, a lot of the details of how we implement this in the microarchitecture. But what I do want to say is that for every structure in the microarchitecture that gets shared, uh, we have a hash function that, that maps operations to that structure to one of the substructures within a composed processor. So for example, if I've got eight cores aggregated together into a single logical composed processor, that means I have eight separate branch predictors. Okay? And so each, each next block that I want to predict is going to map to one of those predictors based on some hash function. Okay? And so really the design goal here in this microarchitecture was to say, what I want to do is when I'm running in a large configuration, I, want, I really don't want to have um, I don't want to have a lot of stuff sitting around for the small configuration that I'm not using. I want to use every structure in the aggregate across the whole thing. When I'm running in a small configuration, I don't want to have a lot of stuff sitting around unused that's there to support a large configuration. And so an example of that might be, you know, one thing we played around with initially but then gave up on is if I've got some number of cores, what I can do is just use one of the branch predictors to, to drive this whole thing. Now, this looks a little bit more like the original TRIPS prototype, which had one global control tile in the corner. When I do that, though, I'm now running a very large window with a small branch predictor. And in a large configuration, all of these other branch predictors are not getting used. So it's all wasted area. And I've got, I, don't, I don't have enough predictor capacity. And I've got all these unused predictors sitting there, which is exactly what we don't want. The alternative is to say, well, maybe I'll just put a really big predictor on this core. Okay. And then when you're running in, in a small mode where you're just using this quarter run of thread, it's total overkill and it's very area inefficient. And so the design philosophy here was for every structure come up with a distributed protocol and the right hash function that will let us use all of these cooperatively to service the thread that's running on this large composed processor. Can you decompose all the architecture structures into separate pieces? We have. Okay. Yeah, so the load store queue, the register file, the branch predictor, the dependence predictor, yeah, all of that has been done. And that, the extra level of indirection through the hashing doesn't introduce delay in the, the normal case? It introduces some delay, but that delay causes a very, very small performance losses. Yeah, they're, they're greatly outweighed by the benefits of getting this extra state. And, and the obvious third question is, what about the load balancing between the various structures? Does the hash function give you a uniform enough di distribution? Uh, in most cases, it does. There are some cases where the hash function doesn't work as well as it should, and you can, you can see a big drop off. And let me give you an example for that. Um, you know, what we do on the, for the data caches is we just do cache line interleaving. So I can say x is x cache, the cache line x is here, x plus 1 goes here, x plus 2 goes here, and so on and so forth. And what that means, and so the load store queue that's coupled with that data cache services all the loads and stores that map to that tile. So if I, if I is, issue store Y here and load Y here, those are both going to be routed up here and be deposited in the load store queue here. And the, there are two problems, or the problem that comes up with that is that these are all sized for one core, and so you have the possibility of overflowing, uh, and a much greater possibility of that. And so th that was actually the, the hardest problem to solve, and that was the problem that resulted in those enormous cams in the original TRIPS prototype that I showed you all earlier. And so what we did is we, is we actually have an ISCA paper that just came out uh, in 07 that, that talks about how we do this. But what we do is we say, okay, well, this is really just like a network buffer. Right? You're sending loads and stores there, and th it's possible that these loads and stores will come across the micro network and find that structure full. And so you basically just have a network flow control problem. Okay? And there's a whole series, you know, set of classic techniques for dealing with that. So one of them is you can knack it and send it back to its original source. Another one is you can just back up into the network but provide virtual channels to avoid deadlocks. Okay, and we tried both of those and they actually both work really well. What's that? This is a message passing architecture, it's just not visible to software. That's exactly right. Okay, there are no new ideas, right? They're all just recycled in, in various <laughs> in various levels, right? So I've seen that one before. Yeah, so here's a here's a uh, another recycling. Um, I wanted to make one other comment. Oh yeah, so Jim, to, to your point though, it's possible that you do get a scenario where all you're doing is a large number of you know byte operations within one uh, you know within one block or within multiple blocks, 
and then you just you just kill this guy and you just got enormous contention going back up through the network and you can see performance drop off really fast and there's a you know there's a, there's a question about how big do you size the structure to you can avoid more and more of those cases by sizing the structure up and so you just want to find the knee of the curve and we're looking at some so, okay so actually this leads very nicely into a another point that I was going to make which is the opportunity here though and what we're really pushing on now is trying to find these hybrid points in between conventional parallel and, and sequential execution and so if I think about treating this as uh, a sequential processor well I really just want um, you know to do have my inner li interleaved cache lines because it's, 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 it's flexible I mean it's not flexible but it's it's, it's understood, the software can reason about it, and so on and so forth. Now there's a question about what happens if I, if I reconfigure, I take an interrupt and then reconfigure this core, so now I'm, this processor is now running on four cores. Okay, now your hash function has changed. Actually, hash functions for everything have changed. And what happens to the data caches is that some of, some of the cache lines will now be in the wrong place because they're supposed to map into a different place. So we don't actually flush the cache lines. What, what happens is at this point, you, you now start up again, and the hash function maps here, and you miss. You go out to the L2, and now you invoke the coherence protocol. Okay, we're assuming a, an on-chip directory protocol, which is what people typically do for these things. Okay, and, and you'll just invalidate this cache line, or if it's dirty, you'll bring it back and then move it here. And so the on-chip coherence protocol sort of naturally takes care of this issue. No. Um, so the, but the, the issue though is that now let's talk about the case that I just said where you've got, let's go back to this, I wanted to talk about the coherence first but now let me go back to this. So now I've got a, I've got a stream of instructions here that are banging on maybe these two cores that are banging very hard on this interleaved cache, cache line. Okay, this is a disaster because you're just flooding packets through the network and you're dealing with you know, power inefficient and lots of contention and whatnot. So what you really want to do in that case is you want to break the interleaving model and tear off a copy and stick a copy here. Okay, you want to treat it like a coherent cache. Okay, so now within your single instruction stream, you can actually now have different loads having shared copies of those cache lines. Okay, but if you write to it, now you're going to have to figure out how to deal with that. And so some cache lines you want to say, okay, there's nice interleaving behavior. Some cache lines you want to say, I want to have copies bouncing around within my sequential instruction stream. Okay, and now there's a question of where do the loads and stores go to, to uh, guarantee sequential semantics? Do they all have to go to this load store queue? Well, okay, so now the load store queue, you can have a pointer that migrates around with that. So depending on where the cache line is, the loads and stores go to that bank. Uh, and if, you, if somebody misses, you invoke the coherent system, which then needs to deal with that case. And one way is flushing, another way is migrating all that state. But now, if, if you can do the software analysis to say, okay, between these sets of loads and stores, there's going to be no sharing. Okay, you don't need to worry about it, and you don't need to do all that stuff with the load store queue. So you haven't paralyzed your program, but you've done one step of it, which is to worry, reason about sharing and, and memory communication between different parts of the code. And so that, again, that's an incremental step which can result in some efficiencies. So I think there's actually a large number of incremental steps there that you can play to say, you know, I don't want to separate things into multiple fetch threads, but I can do the memory analysis. Or I do want to separate the stuff into multiple fetch threads, but the, the memory analysis is too hard to do. Okay, so I think there's actually a really rich hybrid space here. And each, you know, so rather than forcing the software, the programmer to go full bore, you can say, oh, this is something I can do, and I have a pragma here, or the language supports it, or I get this for free in the language. Okay, now the microarchitecture can take advantage of it. But what, the, what that set of things is, and what those interfaces can be, you know, which ones are practical, which ones aren't, is I think a really interesting, interesting question. Okay, so let me hop, oh, I think I should probably wrap up pretty soon. So let me, um, let me hop ahead and show... Uh, I'm not going to talk about compilation. Even though that's an interesting problem. Sorry. Okay. So let me show you some, some uh, initial performance results or, or in-flight in performance results. So this is a set of benchmarks uh, that we took from a bunch of sources. 
uh, you know, embassy, um, some of the Lincoln Labs kernels, uh, VersaBench from MIT, and really the, the, what we wanted was a set of applications that were tractable to assemble by hand, uh, but weren't just you know, irrelevant kernels, and some of these may border on irrelevant kernels like vector add. Um, and so what we did is we actually took the, these kernels and hand assembled them for trips, also ran those hand assembled versions on TFlex with 16 cores, and what I'm showing here is the speed up over an Intel Core 2 uh, using GCC to compile its code. And this, the speed up is measured in cycles. Okay, so we're, we're factoring out clock rate differences here. Uh, and I think that's actually a reasonable thing to do because if you look at the amount of work we're doing per cycle, it's comparable to what a Core 2 would be doing. Pentium 4 is kind of off the rails or, or way, way more aggressive than we could handle without significant microarchitecture changes. Um, and so what, one thing you can see, if you look at the geometric mean, the core two uh, is actually really good uh, compared to the Pentium three and Pentium four. It's running stuff in about half the number of cycles. Okay, so they made they made big improvements. One of which was the addition of a dependence predictor. Um, then, if you compile these codes with ICC, you get another two x boost uh, over compiling with GCC. And it was a little frustrating for us because we were sort of targeting you know Pentium three and Pentium four, and then of course Intel's not standing still. Right, and our speed ups you know, dropped, out, dropped down by 4x. What's that? That's Intel's native compiler. Okay. You all may, may have a better one that you say I really should be using, and, and I don't really want to hear it because you know, I don't want the baseline to get any better. Uh, on, these, be, on these codes, yeah. On, on spec, it's actually a little less. It's more like 40%. Um, that's good news. Or I, actually, depending on... Is GCC really good or is ICC really bad? I don't know. Um, it wasn't optimized for that. Right. Right. Yeah. It, you know, if def, if def M grid, right? Yeah. Um, okay. So, uh, you know, with the, with the uh, TRIPS compiler, which is good but not great, uh, we're getting, you know, about 30% uh, better speed up over Core 2. GCC is still slower with ICC. When we, when we run the, uh, the TFlex with a compiler, uh, compiled code, and this is compiled for trips, but then the instruction placement and scheduling is TFlex aware because the mapping of register files is different. Uh, we actually get a pretty big boost, and then if we go up to the hand code, we're running about you know 2.1x over ICC and and uh, 4x over GCC. What is the y-axis exactly? Is that the y-axis is speed up in cycles normalized to core two with GCC. So if if a program ran in 10,000 cycles on an Intel Core 2 compiled with GCC, and on architecture X it ran in 5,000 cycles, we'd be at the two bar. Higher is a better speed up here, if that's. Why not execution time? Uh, the execution time, we don't use execution time because they're not, they're not comparable. You know, they're manufactured in different process technologies. Uh, they've had different design teams. They've had different design methodologies. You know, I mean, yeah, the, so all of the trips numbers, so actually, we couldn't do the TFlex numbers because we don't know what the clock cycle is because it's just in simulation, right? The, wh what we did do is we did slow down the core two so that the memory speeds were comparable to what we're running on the TRIPS prototype, okay? So, so the, the processor to memory latency ratio is about the same. But of course, all the TRIPS prototype numbers would be down here because we're running at 366 megahertz. So the, the assumption uh, the work done in a cycle Per cycle is, is comparable. And yeah. your microarchitecture versus in Core 2 yeah. and P Pentium 4 and Pentium 3. Well, no, no, no. So my, that was my point about Pentium 4. This, the Pentium 4 point here is actually not a realistic point. If we were actually factoring in execution time, it should actually be higher because it's got a faster clock. Its cycles are not, all cycles are not equal. And the Pentium 4 is kind outside of the, outside of the envelope. Okay. But the rest, I mean, you know, in, in these designs, remember, we don't have any global signaling. All signaling is tile to tile. And if you go more than one tile, you actually pay a cycle penalty. And that shows up in the, in the, in the cycle counts. Okay, so I think the frequency is actually a cheat, you know, some sort of a 2 to 2.5 gigahertz frequencies. If you have 600 designers and a billion dollars is achievable. Okay, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to show um, really one more slide here. And, then, and that's that what we did here was we took a set of these hand assembled codes lump them into high IPC and low IPC, so things with a lot of concurrency in them, native, and things with low, low concurrency in them. And then on the TFlex design, 
just ran them on one, two, you know, four, eight, sixteen, and thirty-two tiles. And what you see here is you get pretty good, you know, linear speed up to two. You fall off at three. You're still doing well at four and eight, and then at you know at sixteen you're starting to get in the point of diminishing returns. And when you go to thirty-two cores, you get nothing. You get a little bit on a few benchmarks. And the reason here is that the array is so large, you just you've got memory communication everywhere, and you've only got four instructions per block per core. So you've got at at best you've got one extra pipeline bubble every four instructions if they're dependent. And that really starts to kill you. And that's why we're looking at some of these heterogeneous, you know, map a whole block here and then a whole block here designs. Uh, Trips is, of course, is a good bit lower because uh, it doesn't have all the extra data cache capacity and bandwidth when you have one of these large composed cores. And this best bar is actually the performance you get when you run each application on the number of cores that works best for it. So that's not varying them within phases, but it is saying, on this application, two cores is best. On this one, 16 cores is best. Uh, and just pick, trying to pick the right number. And you get another bump there. And I think if you go into phases, you get more complexity but an additional bump. And then, of course, the question that we're just starting to struggle with now is what should be the system interface to do that, both for phase detection, recommendation from the compilers, recommendations from the OS in terms of the power consumption. You need some sort of lightweight layer there that's going to be taking in all that input and making resource management decisions. I don't know if that's the hypervisor or, or, or what. Okay, I could go through a lot more numbers, but I think I've talked long enough, so I'll just, uh, I'll just be happy to take some more questions and have some more discussion. I could go ahead to the conclusion slide, but I think you know, parallelism is a problem, and, uh, and I think that just having the hardware give lots of parallel resources that the software has to manage explicitly is not uh, a promising avenue. I think we really want to do stuff in the microarchitecture and the hardware to, give, to allow the software to give some preferences and then to have sort of different targets based on what its needs are. And of course, how we architect that interface is a really interesting question. And I should also follow on to say that there's, that in addition to sort of weird, you know, you're out in la-la land architectures, uh, there are also th more conventional things you can do. Uh, and one example in some, some of our earlier work that I did with, with Guri um, was the coherence decoupling work where you actually, uh, you do speculation on coherence operations that hides a lot of the latency of false sharing. Okay, so rather than saying to an application programmer, you've got to pad all your data structures to avoid false sharing, you can say, here's a hook in the hardware where you can speculate, and if you're false sharing, you'll always speculate correctly. Uh, and so you get back a lot of the form of performance that you've lost because of false sharing misses without actually having to force, you know, expose the cache line size and all that to the application developer. So there are other examples in addition to this stuff. So, so in the TRIPS architecture, you were saying that the, uh, there was it was a microarchitectural decision where to put instructions in your grid. Yes. And so at compile time, you wouldn't, uh, you wouldn't have no knowledge of that. So that no, that's not what I said. Uh. Okay, that's a great question. And I'm sorry if I made that implication. What I said was that the, the compiler generates sequence numbers, or instruction numbers, based on some, some internal set of heuristics. And the microarchitecture interprets those, okay, to, to try to, you know, allow them to be in a good place. You really want the compiler to try to guess what the microarchitecture is going to do and assign them intelligently. But it's not the case that the reservation stations are exposed to the compiler. You know, the compiler has an internal performance model that says if you assign these in these ways to these abstract numbers, this microarchitecture will work well. And there's a long and proud history of that. I mean, you know, the MIPS compilers used to do that with pipeline interlocking, right, and, and reasoning about delays and bubbles. That's right, that's right. And so is, the, is that processor pipeline architecturally exposed to the compiler? Of course not, right? But is the compiler actually have an internal performance model of that processor pipeline? Absolutely, right? And, and it's, it's exactly the same here. Let me make one more comment on that. It turns out that if you actually schedule for the largest possible substrate, so like say 32 cores in T-Flex or even 128 tiles and trips, what happens is your, your greedy algorithm you know, push the stuff that's critical very close together, even if they're not on the same tile, they're on adjacent pieces. And stuff that's, you know, dependent but not so critical might get kind of far away. And stuff that's dependent but totally off the perceived critical path, which isn't always the real critical path, you could miss in a cache, is really far away. And then if the microarchitecture actually has smaller pieces, you just kind of lump these together. And so the compiler's single model actually works really well on a range of, a range of configurations. And so we don't actually recompile for different topologies, although we've done that experiment. 
what we do is we compile for the largest possible size, right? And then locality and criticality are preserved as you start lumping adjacent tiles together into one and kind of working your way down. You just, you just want to, you know, you want to lump adjacent columns and rows together as you scale down the machine. You don't want to put this one together with this one, for example. Rich? So when, uh, going back to the ship start microarchitecture, where you went to the effort of building a ship, uh -huh. uh, what did you learn from that exercise? You know, what, what sort of like lessons that were surprised you? Or Ab well, okay, so... A lot of money, a lot of time spent on building a ship. You know, was it, I guess, was it worth it? Was it worth it? Well, it wasn't my money. <laughs> right. That's a, that's a, it was your money, right? Um, so, but, but, uh, that's right, that's right. A, a more serious answer is that, that there, there are, um, I'd say, three sets of things. There's three levels of kind of analysis. So one is, you kind of know what the right thing to do is, but you're not sure. And so, for example, these 128 instruction blocks, we, we knew they were too big. Turns out 64 is probably the sweet spot, but we deliberately made a decision to pick something that was large so it would push the compiler effort and, and really make them stretch to try to, or us stretch to try to get into that. Okay, so kind of going into the project, we had hypotheses that we were pretty sure was right and we were right. Then there's a second level, which if, once you go and you design the microarchitecture, uh, you learn a lot of things that you didn't have right in your high level performance model. You know, our initial paper in Micro01 on an architecture like this had stuff in it which was just broken. You know, we thought it worked, and, and then when we actually took it down to the next level, no, this, this is actually wrong, right? So you kind of flush those things out, but you don't need to build the chip, right? You need to design all the RTL and simulate it, and, and then what do you actually get out of building the chip? What you actually get, you get two things out of the physical design process, going from RTL down to silicon. You get a real sense for where your critical paths are, and in a new microarchitecture, those are really key. And some of them surprised us, and some of them didn't. Um, so for example, you know, if you're going from an ALU in one tile, to an AL across a network, you know, so output port, input port, ALU and another. Uh, th this, and then, and you want really just a one cycle bubble here in between dependent instruction A issuing on this tile and dependent instruction B on this tile. You're never going to get them back to back unless you cluster the microarchitecture and break the homogeneity of the design. Uh, but here, the, uh, this path turned out to be really critical. And that was kind of unsurprising, but we had to go back and re-architect a lot of the stuff in the network router, in the micronet router, to get that to work and get it in a reasonable cycle time. And so one of the things we do now is when you issue an instruction, the cycle before you stick it in here, you issue a control packet that's going to run down here and wake up the design. Uh, and then so, so by the time the operand comes, the instruction's already been woken up and it's ready to go. Okay, and that's, you know, so that works, but then we ran into problems with predicates because sometimes you get a control packet and it's not actually the right control packet. You know, so there's, there, you, you, get in, you do timing optimizations that get reflected back up into the microarchitecture, and, and then you run into problems, you have to re-architect that come back down. So now that, of course, that's going through the physical design process, that's not actually manufacturing the chip. Okay? Uh, and I think the two things from the actual manufacturing that we got was one, our verification methodology actually worked really well. And we could have discovered that this notion of just beating on your tile interfaces and then trying to do a, kind of a very high level sketchy ver verification of these distributed protocols is sufficient. It turns out that it was and maybe we just got lucky or maybe it actually works. But it's possible that we would have gotten the chip back and find out, like in a lot of the distributed directory protocols, there's just all these corner cases that we totally missed. And you wouldn't know that unless you had hardware to run on and you found the bugs. And then the second thing is, you know, we really, really needed the running hardware to do the software tuning. We couldn't run whole benchmarks you know, to any meaningful degree until, uh, until we had hardware. And now uh, I actually will pull up a, a compiler slide if I can do a binary search to get there. Um, or a sort of a pseudo binary search, yeah. So, oh, did I pull that slide out? I hope not. Okay, well, the, what we're doing now is looking at when you, when you compile the across the range of spec benchmarks, where are the blocks too small and why do they get cut? And it turns out we need you know, profile-driven inlining here. Uh, there's just, you know, we're, 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 we should be unrolling loops that span multiple blocks, and we weren't because we didn't think that's important. And so we have to put support for that into the compiler. There's just all these things that are sort of large-scale structural transformations that you don't see on microbenchmarks, and you can't run the macro benchmarks far enough to get to those and collect that sort of data. You know, and, and it turns out the compiler is a really key portion of this, and, and so 
you know, taking it hard to hardware. Now, if you have something like ramp, you know, may, maybe you can avoid that piece of it. But the, the timing issues and the verification issues uh, will, I don't think, being able to run on FPGAs would solve. But certainly, maybe the software would be more tractable. And that's a great question. I, I've actually been asked it before, as you might, as you might guess. You know. Why, why did you guys spend all this money? You know? Was it worth it? I don't know. I mean, <laughs> time will tell. This is a tangent. Do you have any interesting structures in your hash functions? Because on a different kind of hash, the NSA has really recently got an egg on its face on cryptologic hashes. So did we have any what structures? I'm sorry? In, in, interesting structures in your hash function. No, our hash functions were typically these low order bits. <laughs> and, and actually, the, the branch breaker has these low order bits and one higher level bit. So that was our interesting hash function. <laughs> Right. Um, you know, sorry. Yeah. Our hash functions are really, really boring. Okay, well, we're at time. Thank you all very much for your attention and your great questions.